Because I actually did like a stuff like that. Well, we're like 60, 90, you know. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, full screen. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Cyber Lab. Let's give it up, you know, a bit, you know. Uh, Great friend, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, let's just jump right into this. So, uh, if you want to scan this QR code, we said this on Monday uh, for you know sitting your cyber pals. Uh, I'll, I'll, if anyone didn't take a photo of this yet, just let me know. I'll let a couple people take a photo. Um, just give me a thumbs up, whatever you guys are. Uh, all good? Okay. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, for those who came on Monday, we have Cyber Academy on Mondays. Next week, we have a really cool presentation by Audrey. Audrey, give away wherever. Where, where you, uh, Audrey, <laughs> Audrey. Uh, give it up for Audrey. Uh, same rooms, same time, but on Mondays. So this will be on file forensics if you want to get into defensive security stuff. Really cool. Uh, next week, really cool, we have our ECTF team. This is like our hardware hacking, uh, such embedded systems hacking team in a collaboration with IEEE. Their interest meetings, so that's like first meeting is next Tuesday in Young CS50 from 6 to 8 p.m. This presentation is from Nodder. He is an ECE professor who's advising the team. So if you want to learn more about the, the team, uh, come check that out. Uh, next Wednesday for CyberLab, we have a really interesting presentation on machine unlearning presented by Savannah. Savannah, give a wave. Hi, Savannah. Uh, so come back next Wednesday if you want to hear this talk about machine unlearning. You're like, what the heck that is? You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, PBR, if you're part of PBR, we have our first CTF uh, in end of next week. So 1021, in E6, 12 to 6, mark your calendar for that. This CTF is very, pretty beginner friendly. So if you want to just Come check out PBR for the first time. Uh, block off your time. And if you're not part of team, just want to come play with us, just come check it out. Just pull up. We'll be there. Uh, our first club social is end of week four. We're going to Santa Monica. So uh, make sure to get your tap card if you haven't gotten that yet. That's like completely free for UCLA students. Uh, you can go to the central ticketing office, get that. The form takes like five minutes. So make sure to get that as well. Oh, also, uh, I was told to make this announcement. If you want to play pickup basketball, uh, we meet every Friday, 6 to 8, on the Hedrick Court. So uh, make sure to pull up. Uh, quick show of hands. Who has not filled out this form yet? Okay, so good. So, sorry. Uh, if you need to fill it out, no worries. Fill it out now. But this is good because we have, like, over 160 signups right now. So we're, we're hoping everyone was on there. But it's okay if you haven't yet. Uh, fill this out so that we you you we know you're you're part of the club. Uh, does anyone need the QR code? So you also can find it on acmcyber.com slash join. Uh, okay, great. All right, that's off to Salva. Engineering time. Uh, take five minutes. Introduce yourself to the people around you if you don't know them. Uh, especially if you do know them, try to find someone you don't know. Talk to them. Uh, maybe talk about what your favorite music artist is. I'll give you five minutes uh, ish. That's it. Hello there. I see you're a man of science. Yes, of course. I brought my lights. <laughs> School is good. I got to do They're from the terms of a two. Bugs for two. So we can do a duel. Yes, yes. Come on. What the fuck? So much fun. Hey, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I did talk to you. I don't know. I'm made to understand. Maybe because, you know, I played a violin and I played like the most stereotype. They go fire. I just like mixed sounds. I also enjoy Chinese. I love mixed sounds. Back real quick. It's not five minutes. People ready a little bit better? Uh, quick information spiel. If you don't know us, uh, how our meetings work, our meeting format is pretty simple. We do a very short talk at the beginning where you guys get to learn something really quickly. Don't waste your time with any lectures, things like that. And you get to spend the rest of your time actually learning how to hack things. Today, you get to learn how to uh, develop secure systems, maybe do some hacking as well. If you're in the AI project, you do some hacking on neural networks. Game hacking also happens today. Oh, uh, but yeah, this is our meeting format. You guys have always heard this deal. Uh, if anyone wants to take pictures, here's a quick preview on everything that's happening this quarter for Cyber Lab. So uh, we have some interesting security related talks in the beginning. Uh, you heard about you're hear about from Michelle today. You heard about Savannah's talk next week. Uh, Anderson, where are you? Give a wave in the back. Anderson, he's a member of our club. He's doing a really cool hardware security uh, talk in a few weeks. So definitely come for that if you're like, what the heck is that? Uh, our faculty advisor, Professor Tian, will also be giving a talk. Uh, you know, soon TM because I need to discuss the uh, If you are interested in like sort of cloud engineering, app development, infrastructure, things like that, uh, Jason's doing a really cool talk on how we run the infrastructure for our club. So that's literally if you go to platform.acmcyber.com, how does that get online? And also there's some other apps we'll introduce next week. Uh, Alec will do a really cool careers in cyber talk at the end of the quarter. And this is the date you guys need to mark on your calendar. It says you're all part of Cyber Lab. Uh, we have the AIX Cyber Symposium at the end of the quarter in collaboration with our lovely friends at ACM AI. Um, so make sure to mark your calendar for that because everyone, if you're part of a Cyber Lab project, you'll be presenting your project to a bunch of people, some members of faculty, other members of the club, anyone who sort of comes in. I don't want the free food we're giving out or something like that. So uh, that's pretty cool as well. All right. I think that's it from us. So give it up for Michelle. She's going to talk about usable security. It's going to be great. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, today I'll be going over some basic concepts in usable security. So first of all, what is usable security? Uh, before we actually define what usable security is, I actually want to first go over the definition of human computer interaction. So according to a definition from APN Special Group on Computer Internet Interaction in 1997, um, it is a discipline that is concerned with the design, evaluation, implementation of interactive computer systems for human use and with the study of physical phenomena around the world. Um, in short, it's the discipline of understanding the interfaces between humans and computers. So obviously, as you can see from the graphic I have on the right, it's a very interdisciplinary field. It involves um, business activities in the humanities and social, social sciences, as well as um, uh, subjects from like engineering. I'm so sorry, Michelle. Can, you, can everyone hear her in the back okay? Or Sorry, Michelle, can you speak a little louder for people? Okay, I will try my best. Sorry, my voice is a little low, but yes. Um, so from on the human humanities and social sciences side, we look into factors like human factors and behavior. And then, for example, on the graphic, we have cognitive science, so understanding cognition, um, understanding how the human mind works and responds to interacting with um, technological or computer interfaces. Uh, so in essence, usable security in um, human computer interaction in um, security. So, um, what usable security is very interested in is the human factors in privacy and security, and it's to generally improve the usability of security features in end user applications in order to sort of mitigate information risk that comes with um, users interacting with some sort of platform that deals with sensitive information. This is a relatively new field. It's only less than three years old. As you can tell, um, the definition of 
human computer interaction only came out in the late 1990s. So like what exactly constitutes as use of false security is still a little up for debate. It's not like a super set yet. So why do we care? Um, so a lot of people are like, if we simply make our software and our programs more secure, like why, why does it matter us like if the user, like why does it matter us about the usability of our software and the program? So a really major factor that sort of drives the usable security, the uh, idea of security fatigue, the type of decision fatigue while maintaining all of So decision fatigue basically arise, arises when the amount of sort of energy you have is like not enough for the amount of decisions you have to make. So the more decisions you have to make, the quality of your decision making also goes down. As we see like on the graph on the right. Um, so this is mostly because currently in terms of maintaining security, uh, there are too many decisions that users have to make today, and a lot of these decisions are also very complex. So, it's like constantly new information. So you always hear stuff about, oh, there's another new security breach, <laughs> security vulnerability. There's this software, or if you're like setting up your computer, like, oh, I have to figure out which uh, like which antivirus to use. Um, I have to like handle like software updates. Um. And then, for example, um, say we have things like IoT. So think about like Alexa. Like, these things are so pervasive in our sort of like daily private lives. So uh, it's a lot to keep up with, which is why now we have a lot of people researching exactly how do we make our security mechanisms more usable. So some factors that lead to security fatigue. So. One major factor is the lack of expertise among users. So end users are not going to be like computer scientists. They're just going to be like everyday people. Um, so like even us, like we will, like a lot of us might still fall to sort of social engineering attacks. Um, and she is cited as one of the most common forms of cybercrime. And according to Forbes in, in 2022, there were over 300,000 phishing victims that total to a loss of over 52 million US dollars. So clearly um, the information risk associated with users is very dangerous and it's also extremely expensive. Um, and this poor understanding of security as well as security fatigue, uh, one result that comes up is that a lot of users will make really irrational decisions um, when dealing with or uh, maintaining security and privacy online. Um, so for example, they might see a security dialogue, they might see warnings, um, they might see, for example, like disagreements, whatever. All of these are these are really important like pieces of information in understanding like what the implications of our decisions like online or when using pro program software. Like the security implications, but because it's so much, a lot of people just ignore it. And that's like very dangerous. Um, in businesses, there's this idea of a compliance budget, which is when employees sort of reach their limit when following security policies and requirements. Uh, and so they begin to like reject and then find ways to sort of avoid following the And then a lot of a lot of the fatigue that comes from our decision making is also because we have the solutions we have for maintaining security um, is oftentimes very unpleasant. So for example, think about how many text passwords do you have? Um, how many of them are the same? Even though you know it's not like, it's a very insecure thing, but like you, you most of your passwords look about the same. <laughs> um, how many times a month? I want to do that. How many times a month do you type out your credentials? And today, how many times um, have you guys opened the Duo mobile app when logging into UCLA? So it's just um, authentication is a really big problem. And unfortunately, we don't have a very pleasant solution just in general for it. Um, and then 
But this lack of expertise is not just a problem for users, but also for interface designers. So most interface designers also tend to just, um, are usually the application developers themselves. So they're not usability or security mm -hmm. experts. So they don't come into the development process with a security mindset. A lot of the features that they implement for privacy and security are usually um, uh, it's like sort of like a deficiency in like usable like security uh, mechanism libraries. Um, a lot of developers are also not really able to even sort of implement mechanisms. Uh, um, just in general, um, and Daryl, users don't really understand what they're doing. Developers sometimes also don't really understand what they're doing. So it's a lot of, uh, pretty, it's very problematic. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. So um, because of all these problems, there have been efforts to sort of come up with like a set of gu guidelines um, in terms of like design principles. And then one that's pretty frequently cited and one that I also think is pretty interesting is cognitive. Uh, and that's all to less than here. Um, I'll go over some of the more, I think, important ones since we don't have a lot of time today. I think the first one is the of So it is sort of human nature to choose the path of least resistance. Like, if we can spend less effort doing something, we want to spend less effort. The most natural way is. Um, the most secure way of having the mask and all times you might hear people say like, oh, you, can't, you have to like balance, you can't have the scope, visibility, and security. But Kanye actually argues that uh, that we should think about our tools uh, when designing our tools. Try to make it easier to do things more effectively, um, and make safety precautions more intuitive and natural. So um, he says, like um, a system that is more secure is more effective, more reliable, and predictable. Likewise, a more usable system is easier to understand and thus more likely to be secure, both security and usability. Um, so basically. Usability and security all have one common goal, which is we want the computer to correctly do what the user wants. Um, and then like a uh, sort of real life non-information security example of the path of least resistance is, for example, if we have a food processor, um, we can only turn it on when the lid is closed. But it's also like, that's the most natural way to do things. Like if you want to use this machine, you have to close the lid first. So that's sort of the idea of being, um, designing our tools in order to make security. Um, the second one is active authorization. So related to this is this idea called Seltzer's principle of lead privileges. And it's the idea that every program of a system to operate using the lead that is put in there. Think about like, for example, security software. Like suddenly the uh, authority to just delete and all the files at random, right? So that's sort of the idea. Um, then there's also the idea of sorry, revocability, which basically means if user makes mistakes when granting these authorities, they should be able to sort of undo it. It may not undo the damage, but at least it can prevent further damage. Um, 
um, visibility just means showing enough information um, that the user needs to see, not overloading them with information. Um, Self-awareness, making sure that the users, that the authorities that the user grants to applications is actually an accurate reflection of the task that they are trying to complete. And then similarly, like expressiveness and then relevant boundaries just means that we have proper boundaries between different objects and actions. So we have a program uh, it might have a lot of modules and shared libraries. We don't necessarily want the user to have access to all of them. So some of these need to be in the user interface, but then we also need to set a boundary and then sort of hide some of these things behind the user interface. Um, so the user can sort of avoid giving away more authority than they actually should. Um, identifiability just means like, we don't want, like, for example, some untrusted program to suddenly spawn a pro um, another program that looks really similar to, for example, like my, I don't know, like my banking app. And then, like, I'll think that's my actual banking app and then give my credentials. And then now some really suspicious person knows my password to my bank account. Uh, foresight is sort of, um, it's sort of understanding that users might not always be able to sort of perceive um, their abilities. And then as a result, they might make the wrong decisions when like granting these authorities that can have security consequences. So being able to sort of predict how a user might behave in response to, um, or how a user might behave when trying to execute a task. Well, I'm going to be going over three studies really briefly. So this first one is why Johnny can't encrypt. It's a pretty old study it's from 1999. Um, probably the it's the oldest one of the three I'll be going over briefly. But it basically, um, we know that we know that um, email as like a medium is not very secure. So there's an encryption program or there was one in 1999 called PGP 5.0. And they were sort of testing like how good is the user interface actually in helping users be able to sort of encrypt their data. And then at the time it was considered to have pretty good usability, but the authors sort of found that only one third of the uh, subjects were able to actually correctly sign and encrypt an email message. Um, some people, like a fourth of them, just gave out the secret information like almost immediately. Um, one person just couldn't figure out the entire time how to use it. Um, and then some of the problems with this user interface was, um, A, there was too much information. It was a little too technical, especially like at the time for most people to understand if they didn't have the technical expertise. Another uh, problem I had, which I think was really interesting, is that I had a lot of inconsistent language. A lot of times it would interchangeably use words like inconsistency, <laughs> and for to one with technical expertise, it may be sort of more clear that these things are kind of the same thing. But to an end user who has no idea what like or like has no idea how like encryption model even works. Like they might think that these are all separate processes and it'd be completely overwhelmed by how many steps they have to take. The reality is much less than that. Um, this is a more recent study um, on security labels. Um, so basically in uh, 20, sorry, in yeah, 2020, Apple App Store basically required for all app developers when releasing a new app or releasing app updates to disclose sort of the data collecting practices that they were using. Um, so the study that sort of surveyed or analyzed how like both app developers sort of into this new requirement. And they observed that in active apps, so apps that weren't having new updates and thus weren't really forced to really disclose um, these practices. They had very little incentive to create this sort of policy label. 
um, in November of 2021. Basically, half of the apps um, in the app store didn't have a privacy label. So there was sort of this general observe, um, observance that there's a lot of um, sort of this aversion, aversion like this, a slow uptake in sort of meeting these requirements um, to disclose the privacy um, the privacy and security information of each of these apps. Um, and then another similar study is with um, security labels on um, IOTs or any other things. Um, so there was a study from CIMU in 2020 that sort of explored the test, like the design of a label sort of what type of information should be on these, like, sort of like a nutrition label to sort of inform users um, the sort of data collection practices, um, certifications it might have achieved, uh, whatever. Um, and what they came up with was a sort of a primary label for sort of like a general audience, like very basic information a lot of people might be interested in. Um, and then sort of behind the primary label, your QR code or URL, they came up with the idea of a secondary label, which people could then access and then if they have more technical expertise or want to research the product more in depth, um, they could check that out and then have, um, be able to view the more detailed secondary label. Um, yeah. Um, but there are still some problems with this is because Different users might have different concerns. So the sort of the idea of a, a singular or like a single like a set of like a fixed number of ratings is sort of problematic in the sense that some people might care about, for example, factors A and B, but then other people might care more about factors C and D. So it's sort of not, it's sort of hard to come up with a universal set of standards. Um, it also sort of creates a sort of unhealthy incentive for companies to try to gain the ratings of safety. So obviously if the highest rating is like five stars, well every company is gonna try to get to five stars. Cause if you have four stars and it's like the users are gonna be like, why isn't your product five stars? And then no one will buy it. So it's also sort of like is it really useful even in the long run. And then the last one I want to talk about is IoT <laughs> Um, so IOTs, um, <laughs> if you don't know what they are, they are, um, it stands for Internet of Things, and they're basically devices with sensors, software, and other technologies that are connected to a network and can exchange data with other devices and systems. So think of things like Amazon, Echo, Alexa, Google Maps. I'm going to be focusing more on the ones um, in the home today because of the sort of the interesting nature of the user and their social relationships when using IOTs. Uh, so one unique feature of IOTs is that the security problems of them um, tend to be, there's still a lot of technical problems in, uh, in terms of security, like uh, hardware attacks or like um, if it's like ML based, like the poisoning of data sets and models. But there's also the problem, for example, lots of people are going to be accessing an IoT in a home that aren't necessarily the people that should always be accessing at every, um, at every second of the day. For example, um, children might have access to IoTs, uh, babysitters, neighbors, friends, guests. So um, it's more of the idea that access control to these smart home technologies might not be it might not be as good to use a sort of traditional model of, for example, authentication by X passwords that sort of grants universal access to a user if they have this, um, they have these credentials. Rather, it should be more situational or context-based. And if we want to have sort of contextual access, this sort of implies that we need more sensors. And so this now brings up the problem of the usability of sensors. Um, so, um, yeah, so for example, if we have sensors detect the uh, presence or absence of a variable when, de uh, when determining whether or not to sort of give uh, authority to the user, 
um, there's this problem called physical um, deny of not say on yeah, but it's sort of um it's basically called um physical denial service basically someone can come in jam block move your sensor to prevent accurate sensing uh and so this is very very problematic for not just context side but also for like if the iot is automated and then another whole plethora of problems um so on the slide, I have a list of the different types of data for local attacks. The, um, a study calls them basically the sort of the attacks that come from people who are near the location of the IoT, not necessarily malicious attackers, attackers from like a network um, or from or like targeting the hardware stuff. So like people like, as I mentioned, friends, guests, uh, children, neighbors, burglars, etc. So we have two types of access, indoors and outdoors. Obviously, indoors has a lot more advantages. They have access to the, they're able to observe sort of and then figure out what the access control policies and audits are, and then thus be able to select information like voice or photo in order to bypass them or biometric uh, forms of effect and not a lot of um, um, they use. Um, there's also in the dimension of expertise. Uh, like we said, there are a lot of expert attackers, but a really big problem also lies with the non expert attackers. So they're able to carry out replay and imitation attacks, which is basically beating the sensors, for example, um, the user's voice who has access to the IoT. Um, and then as well as like blocking off sensors or um, if, if, if we have sensors for contact sensing. So a really good example is, for example, a child. Um, if the IoT is granted authentication through a smartphone um, by the, a smartphone that belongs to the child's parent, the child can steal the parent's smartphone. And if they like know the pin or whatever, um, use it. And now they can, for example, use it to turn on the smart TV, even though the parent does not want that to happen. Um, and then the last sort of um, dimension is, is resemblance. It's not as big of a problem, but for example, if you have siblings, cousins, especially like twins, they look similar. Um, you can They can carry out imitation attacks, spoofing. Um, there's also just a higher possibility of inadvertent false positives. So basically, when the sensor just um, just incorrectly detects an identity or situation and then compromises access control. These are just uh, two of the papers that I looked at in terms of the studies, if you want to check them out later. Uh, thanks for listening. Any questions for Michelle? I actually had a question. So uh, I was reading something lately about, uh, you know, in the, in the Google Chrome security. So in the browser, they have a lock that many people are familiar with. And they were debating whether or not that's a good form of Google security, since obviously the lock has caused some misconceptions for people. What do you think? Lock accurate sort of representation of actual security. Um, honestly, I think it is. It is like would is your question like is this a good form of capability? Uh, it's it's your opinion. Yeah, okay. okay, I think most people probably don't really understand the implications of the lock, um, like what it actually represents, and also like. To be honest, if I really want to access a website, like I'm not gonna really care if there's a lock or not. So, and then like that versus like, I don't actually know the security consequences. So just the symbol of it or the lack of it doesn't really sort of change my opinion. I think most end users' opinions of their, what the implications of their decisions. Michelle, uh, does anyone actually here know what the, the lock means on the Chrome browser? Chrome, here's the officer, so I'm not going to call him. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah.
is a true connection. Uh, yeah, it's like encrypting traffic. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we have a feedback form if you just want to take a photo real quick. Uh, if you are trying to get points for members at uclaacm.com, uh -huh. we put the code at the end of our feedback form. So if you want points, uh, please fill out our feedback form. It really helps us improve and figure out how to make these sort of meetings better. Uh, I'll give everyone a second to sort of grab that. Um, Based on the standards, what do you say, like the pop-up for like certain website that says this site is not secure? Would you say that is better, like more usable security? Well, I was, like, like I mentioned, <laughs> the dialogues, we see them a lot, we get tired of them. We'll say it's, it's definitely a case of usable security, but whether or not it's a really... Yeah, it's the person's really like determined to 